I was flicking through this 1978 copy of Practical Photography magazine sometime last year when I was drawn towards this advert for a Yashica FR1, saying that it was 10 years ahead of the competition. I think we can take the 10 years ahead of the competition bit with a pinch of salt, but it did sound quite interesting, sharing some of its technology with the more expensive Contax RTS. I already have a soft spot for Yashica. My first SLR was this Yashica J5. It was very second hand when I got it and already had some issues, but I worked round those using it as my main camera for many years. Anyway, when a suitably priced FR1 came up on eBay, I bought it. I'd already got some lenses that I'd been using on a mirrorless camera, so I put the 60 to 300 lens that came with the camera to one side and checked over the camera for anything that needed fixing before I could use it. I'll talk a bit more about the repairs later in the video, but for now we can take a look around the camera. Starting at the front, there's the lens release button on the side of the lens mount. There's a pretty good selection of lenses available with the Contax Yashica bayonet. Below that is the depth of field preview button. Always nice to have, but missed out on a good chunk of cameras. Then we have the self timer, which I guess is slightly unusual in operation. Advance the shutter, turn the self timer lever to its set position, then start the timer by rotating this additional lever in the same direction. And your shot is taken about 7 or so seconds later, so you'd need to run fast to join the group shot you were attempting to photograph. It seems a bit odd that the self-timer is clockwork when the rest of the shutter is electronically controlled, but maybe that was a step too far when this camera was released in 1977 or thereabouts. Over on the other side is the pretty standard flash sync socket. Moving to the top of the camera you've got the film rewind crank in a pretty standard position, with the film speed and exposure compensation dial around the outside. Lift the ring and rotate it to line up with the appropriate film speed. Then in normal shooting you'll leave the compensation set to one times. If you want to overexpose you can rotate the ring without lifting it to two times to overexpose by one stop and four times to overexpose by two stops and similarly to half and quarter for underexposing. Next to that is the battery test button, which lights up this LED beside the frame counter. There's a hot shoe on top of the prism, and then we come to the shutter speed knob, with speeds ranging from one second to one thousandth of a second, plus bulb. There's also a flash position, which shoots at around one thirty-fifth of a second, and auto, which puts the camera into aperture priority auto exposure mode. The available slow shutter speed is extended to four seconds when using the auto mode. Next to that is the beautifully smooth film advance lever, with the electronic shutter release in the middle. This has a very nice light, but not too light feel to it, but it has no mechanical connection to the shutter, so no batteries means no photos, regardless of which speed you select. Finally on the top is the frame counter, which resets when you open the back, as you'd expect. The back opens in a fairly standard way by pulling up the rewind crank, thusly. There's a slider that turns on the exposure meter. It's usually a momentary switch, but you can lock the meter in the on position by first pulling the film advance lever slightly. The meter will then stay on until you push the lever back in. Next to that is a socket for the electronic remote shutter release. On the bottom of the camera are electrical connections for a motor drive, with the drive connection over here. There's a tripod socket right where it should be, in the centre. The film drive release button which allows you to rewind the film, and the all important battery hatch. Inside you'll find a 4LR44 or A544 battery. Rather handily, this camera was designed to use a 6 volt silver oxide or alkaline battery, so there's no messing around with zinc air hearing aid batteries this time round. The viewfinder is a little dirty on my example, but I didn't think it was bad enough to justify removing the flexible PCB in order to get the prism out, so I'll live with that for now. 
along the top of the apertures and down the right-hand side of the shutter speeds, with a red area top and bottom to show when the correct exposure is beyond the available shutter speeds. There's also a red M flag that pops out when you're shooting in manual mode. Put the camera in auto and it goes away. The focus screen has a diagonal split screen focusing aid in the centre and a micro prism around that. The shutter is a horizontal cloth focal plane shutter as used on so many cameras over the years. Loading a film is very much the same as on other cameras. Pull up the rewind knob slightly and drop the film cassette into the recess. Push the rewind knob back in, possibly rotating it a little so that the dog engages. Pull the film leader across and slot it into the take-up spool. Advance the film once and fire a shot, making sure it's in manual mode or it will do a long exposure. Check that it's sitting flat between the film guides and it's engaged with the teeth on the sprocket. And close the door. Advance the film and fire a shot. Advance the film again and fire another shot. These are just to get rid of the exposed film at the beginning of the roll, and then you're ready to head out and take photographs. OK, time to have a look at some of the first shots taken on this camera. I was heading to the photography show at the NEC, so I popped a roll of Kodak Vision 3 500T film in and set out to get some test shots. The majority of these were shot in auto mode because it works really well on this camera. There's always models with fairly elaborate sets to shoot at the show, but I had a vague plan that I wanted to get a shot of someone else photographing the model rather than just a generic shot of a model. Or a shot that showed the model and the set, but included some of the general show clutter to give the shot a sense of its real surroundings. These are probably the best two, the latter one being shot through the crook of another photographer's arm as they took their own shot. The photos of the show were nothing special, but it really doesn't matter as all I was doing was testing the camera and seeing how the 500T film performed in these conditions. The shots will probably never be seen again outside of this camera test video. Right, time to talk about the repairs. Unusually for the stuff that I buy, the FR1 didn't need much doing. The light seals and the mirror bumper foam needed replacing, and the whole camera needed a bit of a clean, but the only actual fault was the frame counter which wasn't working. This seems to be a common fault with the FR1. It's a very similar problem to the one many people will have with scale electric cars and some models of Walkman, a split nylon gear. In the case of scale electric cars, the nylon motor pinion is a friction fit on the motor shaft, but after many years the nylon gear can simply split under the strain and you lose drive. Replacement pinions for the scale electric cars are easy to get hold of and fit, but getting a replacement for the Yashica will be more or less impossible, unless you have one custom made, which would be prohibitively expensive. So I removed the counter drive shaft and pulled the broken gear off. I then clamped the gear gently so that the split closed up and bored out the hole until it was just a shade bigger than the drive shaft. Trying to reinstall it with the undersize as original would only force the split open again. Next I abraded the end of the drive shaft where the gear sits and the inside of the gear so both surfaces were rough. Applied a drop of super glue and clamped the gear onto the shaft. Once I was happy that the glue had set, I reassembled the camera and tested it with the equivalent of about four films. It's not a particularly strong repair, but there's very little torque on that part, so it may well work for years. As a bit of an aside, for my dramatic reconstruction I glued the old scale electric pinion to a bit of bicycle spoke, and it's actually worked much better than I thought. Nothing I can do by hand will remove the pinion, so maybe this will be a more permanent repair than I thought. OK, time for some more shots taken on the test roll, and then I'll give a quick summary.
The Kodak Vision 3 500T film performed really well, as it did on the previous roll that I shot. It has excellent exposure latitude and a great overall look, but it's all a bit of a faff either developing it yourself or using specific labs that can handle the remjet removal process. I'll put a link in the description to my previous video looking at the Vision 3 film. I guess one day I'll have to try Cine Still as that bypasses the remjet removal issue. As for the camera, I absolutely love it. It does everything that it should do, it feels and sounds great, and you're less likely to bump into someone else using the same camera when you're out and about, because it isn't a Canon, Nikon or Leica. The shutter speeds are very accurate and consistent, more so than on many fully mechanical cameras, although some of the better ones do also perform pretty well. I've been itching to get this video filmed so I can use the camera again. It's definitely going to be one of my workhorse cameras from now on. I think that more or less covers it. If you've enjoyed watching, please like the video and maybe even subscribe to the channel, not forgetting to click on the bell icon so you get notifications when a future video is released. That's it for now, so thanks for watching, and I'll see you in a future video.